So good morning, students. Uh, it's a very important topic that I'm going to speak about today. It's the topic of vectors. There are two types of quantities in physics, scalars and vectors. So all of the quantities in physics can be either classified as scalars or vectors. Scalar quantities are just numbers. Like they do not have a, a direction. They only have a magnitude. So for example, mass. So when you say the mass of a person is 50 kilograms, you are talking about the size of the magnitude. That's 50. And kilogram is the unit. So if you have another person whose mass is 30 kilograms, the combined mass of the two would be 80 kilograms. That means when you have scalar quantities, you can simply add them or you can subtract because they are just numbers. On the other hand, when we come to vector quantities, we cannot do that. We cannot simply add them. So we're going to look at the differences in a moment. But first, quantities specified by a number and unit are scalar. I've given some examples, time, mass, length, area, temperature, etc. But quantities that are specified by both magnitude and direction. See, so you need both. You need the magnitude and the direction. These quantities are vectors. Example, displacement, velocity, time, acceleration, force, momentum, and so on. A vector quantity is represented by a line and an arrow. So here, the displacement is represented by a line. The length of the line represents the magnitude. So if it's uh, bigger, then the, the line would be longer. And the direction is specified by the arrow. So that's a vector quantity. So here is an example that clearly gives you the difference between a scalar and a vector. So let's say that you got to go from A to B. You can go from A to B along different routes. You can take this route or you can take this route or a third one. And if you measure the route that you have taken, that would be called the distance. So the distance from A to B is a scalar. But when you measure from A to B in a straight line in one particular direction, from, from A to B in a straight line, that is a vector and that's called displacement. So you see the difference between distance and displacement. Distance is a scalar, displacement is a vector. So there can be many distances from A to B because you can take different routes, but there's only one displacement from A to B. And the displacement is the shortest distance from A to B. So that clearly gives you an example of what a vector is. Okay. So the dashed curves are the actual paths and AB is the displacement vector. Now, some fundamental properties of vectors. So as you see here, A and B are not equal vectors. Of course, A is bigger than B, but they are parallel. A is parallel to B. And in this case, that is again true. A and B are parallel. Well, here B is bigger than A, but they are parallel. On the other hand, in this case, A is anti-parallel to B because they are in opposite directions. That means the angle between them is 180 degrees. Once again, here A is anti-parallel to negative A. So again, you see that if this is vector A, this is vector negative A, which will be the same size, but exactly in the opposite direction. 
And here A and B are equal because their lengths are the same and they're also pointing in the same direction. So A and B are equal. And then there is a special case of orthogonal vectors where the two vectors make an angle of 90 degrees. So they are at right angles to each other. So these are two examples of orthogonal vectors. And you see, the most important thing that we need to know in this chapter and in so many chapters to come is how to find the resultant of two vectors, how to add vectors, how to subtract vectors. So let's take a look at that. So here you have a vector A, another vector B. We got to find the resultant of them. That means find the vector sum of them. So if A is 7 units and B is 10 units, then the sum is not 17 units. No, not 7 plus 10. You can't do that. So instead to find the resultant, we move A parallel to itself right here. So you see that this is moved parallel to itself and drawn here. So that's A, so do the same thing with B. B, remember the length must be the same and this should be parallel. So now we have A and B coming off from one point. And then the parallelogram is to be completed. So you draw an equal length here, equal to B, from here draw an equal length to A and of course parallel to it and so now you have a whole parallelogram and the diagonal of the parallelogram passing through that point where the two vectors come from that diagonal gives the resultant. So if we had taken uh, one centimeter is equal to one unit this would have been seven centimeters this would have been ten centimeters Right? And then if you take a scale or a ruler and measure this length, and let's say it comes out to 11 centimeters, I'm just making it up, then you know that the resultant is 11 units. Okay? So that is the graphical method of finding the resultant of two vectors. And once again, I've uh, written here, R is not equal to A plus B. It's not just the sum of 7 and 10. It's not 17. In fact, in my example, I said it's 11. It's always going to be less than 17. Now, how do we find the uh, difference between two vectors? So if you want to find A minus B, then what you do is you take the exact opposite of B, which is here, which is negative B, and then add it to a. So if you add A with negative B, you're going to get A minus B. So A plus minus B is A minus B, right? So that's what is shown here, and I, I'm going to make it even better. So what I do is, so there's already A here, and then from here I'm going to draw B from the end of A. Draw B, and then we will see what happens, okay? So here is negative B, and then this is A minus B. So again, this is A, this is B, negative B, and this is A minus B. So that's how we find the resultant of vectors. So you can either add two vectors or take the difference between two vectors in this way. Now, this not only works for two vectors, it works for any number of vectors. So if you can take one vector and fit it on to the tip of the next one, as shown in this diagram, it will work for any number of vectors. So here is a vector A. B is fitted on to the, the tip of A. Same thing with C. D, you see they are all in one flowing direction. Do you see that? So if you start from here, the vector is going this way. B is going the same way. C is again the same way. So they are all in one flowing direction. If they are all in one flowing direction, 
then to find the resultant of these vectors, all you got to do is join the starting point to the finishing point. That would give the resultant of the two vectors. And this again works for any number of vectors. So one question here is, if there was another vector uh, that had been connected from E to here, okay, if that had been connected from E here, like that, so that means you, you close the diagram, what would be the resultant of those vectors then? Of course it'll be zero. So if you're able to start from a point and then come back to the same point, the net sum of all those vectors is zero. They add up to zero. Okay? Keep that in mind. So again, resultant R is A plus B plus C plus D plus E. The sum of all those vectors is what I've been saying. So that's one method of finding the result, and that is called the graphical method. But here is another one which we will be using throughout the course. So whenever you want to add vectors, what we do is we resolve them into their X and Y components. So when you're given a vector like A, so that's a vector A, it can be broken up or resolved into its X component, AX, and its Y component, AY. So you could have drawn the AY here because you know that this will be exactly equal to this, okay? So which would give you an idea of a right angle triangle here. You see the right angle triangle? And if you had taken an angle theta here, theta, then wouldn't this become the opposite side? And this would be the adjacent side. So from the definition of sine theta and cosine theta, we can now actually find the values of AX and AY, which I'm going to show you. So this is called resolution of vectors or finding the components of a vector. So we have AX because this is the opposite, this is the adjacent side, we're gonna get AX is A cosine theta, while this is the opposite side, so we will get AY as A sine theta. That is from the definition of sine and cosine. And then if you wanna find the magnitude of the vector, you can just take the square root of AX squared plus AY squared, you know, AX squared plus AY squared root gives you the magnitude of the vector. Another way of writing the vector is by using the unit vectors. Let me tell you what unit vectors are. I, J, K are unit vectors. A unit vector is uh, a vector of magnitude one unit and it specifies the direction. So when you say I hat, like you see here, I hat, that's the unit vector along the x-axis. J hat is the vector along the y-axis. And K hat is the vector, unit vector along the z-axis. Now in my example, there are only two because it's a two-dimensional vector, it's not 3D but you could have 3D. So any vector can be represented as AXI plus AYJ plus AZK, okay? So that is the unit vector representation which we are going to be talking about more as we go on. Remember the magnitude of the vector, like I told you, square root of AX squared plus AY squared and the angle theta, see the angle theta? Tan is opposite by adjacent so tan theta would be AY by AX. So those are the um, relations between these components and the angle there. So once again, you see the same thing that I was saying, AX is AXI, see that? I is the unit vector along the X axis. AY is AYJ, which is the unit vector along the Y axis. And then if you have 3D, then you could have IJK unit vectors. 
and then this would be what you get actually. So try to look at this. So this is your vector, which is divided into its three components, AX, AY, and AZ. And you have AX now, this is the X axis, so that's AXI. This is the Y axis, so you have AYJ, and then you have the Z axis, okay? So that is what you have. And uh, the left hand now shows you, see all three, so that's, oh, you can't see, so that's the X axis, and then you have the Y axis and the Z axis, okay? X, Y, Z, all perpendicular to each other, okay? So that's one way. So now A can be written as AXI plus AYJ plus AZK. And uh, in this case, the magnitude would be again similar to before, square root of the sum of the squares of all three. There are two important types of products between vectors. One is called the scalar product or the dot product. So you multiply, in the sense multiply two vectors, you can multiply them this way. And the scalar product or the dot product is represented as A dot B and it is AB cosine phi, where phi is the angle between the two vectors A and B. So if you have two vectors A and B like that, and the angle between them is what, 90 degrees? And cosine 90 is, uh, come on, cosine 90 is zero. So that means when you take the dot product of two orthogonal vectors, you're always going to get zero. So I dot J, yeah, wait, I dot J is zero. Correct. What about J dot K? Zero. What about I dot K? Zero because they are orthogonal vectors. So whenever you take the dot product of two vectors at 90 degrees, you get zero. On the other hand, what about I dot I? That's, what's the angle between I and I? Zero degrees. And cosine zero is one. I hope you're not confused. Cosine zero is one. So I dot I, what's the value of I? One, because it's a unit vector. So I dot I will give you one. Same thing with J, J dot J, 1, K dot K, 1. So remember, the dot product of the same vector is 1, but the dot product of one vector with another, like I and J, J and K, I and K is 0. Remember that. So here, uh, the scalar product or the dot product of two vectors always gives a scalar. Oh, that's very important. So you're taking the dot product of two vectors, right? They are two vectors. But after you take the dot product, what you get is a scalar. The best example that comes to mind is force and displacement. We'll see that when you take the dot product of force and displacement, you get work. Force is a vector. Displacement is a vector, but when you take the dot product between force and displacement, what you get is a scalar. Work is a scalar quantity. Interesting. So here's an example of how to find the angle between two vectors using the idea of dot product. So there are three dogs applying forces on a stick, and the forces are given here, F1, F2, and F3 are the three forces applied by the dogs. And we have to find the angle between F1 and F2. Okay, find the angle between an F1 and F2. So, how is the dot product defined? The dot product is defined as F1 dot F2 would be what? Let me stop this. Okay, F1 dot F2 would be F1 F2 cosine phi. So if you rearrange, cosine phi would be F1 dot F2 divided by F1 F2. I'm going to write that, but that's the basic idea. So we need to do two things. First of all, we need to find the dot product between F1 and F2. Second, we need to find the magnitudes of F1 and F2 and multiply them. 
So let's first find the magnitude of F1 and F2. How do you find the magnitude of F1? Magnitude of F1 means how big it is, the length of vector. So that will be 10 squared plus 20.4 squared plus 2 squared, right? Square root of that. So although this is negative, you know, taking the negative square gives makes it positive. So that's why I've written that. So that gives you that. Do the same thing for F2. So 15 squared plus 6.2 squared root square root of that. All right, now let's take the dot product. When you take the dot product, remember, you only need to look at the like coefficients. So i dot i gives you one, right? But i dot k gives you what? Zero. So you do, don't have to multiply 10 with 6.2. You don't have to multiply 20.4 with 6.2. You only have to multiply 10 with negative 15, because that's i and i, and then 2 with negative 6.2, because that's k and k. I hope you understood. So that's what I'm doing. So 10 times negative 15 plus 2 times negative 6.2, and do the math, that gives negative 162.4 newtons. Now to find the angle, cosine of the phi is F1 dot F2 divided by F1 F2. We already got F1 dot F2 as what? Negative 162.4. And then F1 F2 is simply the product of these two numbers. And then you get negative 0 0.439. And phi would be cosine inverse of negative 0 0.439, which gives... 116 degrees. Let's take a look at uh, the cross product or the vector product. When you take the cross product of two vectors, what you get is also a vector. First of all, a cross product is defined as a cross b is equal to a b sine phi. See, the dot product was defined as a, B, cosine phi, but the cross product is A, B, sine phi. It's one difference. Second thing is that because the cross product of two vectors gives another vector, now we need to find the direction of that vector, the vector that you get. In order to find that direction, we have the idea of a right-hand corkscrew. You know, so like if you're trying to Remove a corkscrew from a bottle. Well, you turn it counterclockwise, don't you? Counterclockwise, when you're trying to remove it. And so the tip of the screw is moving up because you're removing it. So if you have two vectors, A and B, as shown here, A and B, and if you're taking A cross B, then you got to measure the angle from A to B. A to B. So how are you moving? Counterclockwise. A to B. And then that's why the cross product gives a vector C which is upwards because the cork screw is moving up. On the other hand, if you take B cross A, same two vectors, but you're taking B cross A, now you got to measure the angle from B to A. See that? So how are you moving now? Now you're moving clockwise. Clockwise. So it's like tightening the cork. So how is the tip moving? You're tightening it, so it's moving down. Clockwise, tightening, down. So when you take B cross A, you get this as the vector, which is actually negative of what you got before. What does that show? That shows that A cross B is equal to negative B cross A. So you get the same number, but you will get a negative number when you take B cross A. That's what it means. That's what I've shown here now. More clear, counterclockwise, rotation, it's moving up. Clockwise, it's moving down. So that's what I've shown there, okay? So that should be clear. So here is an example. So let's say A is AXI plus AYJ plus AZK. And then you have another vector B, which is BXI, <coughs> excuse me, plus BYJ plus BZK. And we want to find the cross product. 
A cross B. So what you do is we use the matrix method. So where you have I, J, K, and then you list the coefficients, first the coefficients of A, then the coefficients of B. Why? Because it's A cross B. So that's why we list A first and then B. And then we're going to take it. So what you do first is to find I, to find the coefficient of I, you forget about this and just go AY times BC minus AC times BY. See that? Okay. AY, BZ minus AC, BY. Now, to find the coefficient of J, forget about this. And then go AX, BZ minus AZ, BX. But remember to put a negative. So negative J, AX, BZ minus a, C, B, X. And then to find the coefficient of K, I think you would have got it by now. Just forget about this. And then go A, X, B, Y minus A, Y, B, X. So plus K into A, X, B, Y minus A, Y, B, X. That's how you find the cross product of two vectors. Let's work out some more examples. Here is an example. An adventurous dog strays from home, runs three blocks east, two blocks north, one block east, one block north, and two blocks west. Assuming that each block is about 100 meters, how far from home and in what direction is the dog? Use a graphical method. In many physics problems, if not all, diagrams are crucial. This one certainly need a diagram because it's a graphical method. So first it goes what? It goes uh, to the east, so that's to the east and then two blocks to the north and then one block to the east, one block north and then you got it. Okay, so that's finally how it ends up. So A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, and then E, F. And the resultant is, of course, A, F. So, right? So all we need to do is find A, F using a graphical method. Okay? That's all we need to do. And one block is how much? 100. One block is 100. And uh, this example is easier because you only have now, thankfully, the dog is either moving along the X or the Y axis. It's not going at an angle, see? So it's easier. You only have X and Y. So we can take AF as 5 centimeters to draw it. That's what I've actually done. I considered one block to be 1.4 centimeter. So 5 centimeters would be what? 3.57 blocks. Let me explain. So what I did is, I took one block as 1.4 centimeters. So first, three blocks to the east, you see, that was like 4.2 centimeters. So I see D is exactly uh, 1.4 centimeter because it's one block. So that's the scale that I used. You can use any scale. But remember, whatever scale you use is what you're going to use at the end. Because then you measure this, I measured this, I found that AF is exactly 5 centimeters. So according to the scale I used, 5 centimeters should be 3.57 blocks. Because it's 5 times, uh, I mean it's uh, 5 divided by 1.4. Ooh, 5 divided by 1.4, so that gives 3.57 blocks. And each block is 100 meters, so 3.57 blocks would be 357 meters. So... That's how much it has gone. We need to find the angle now. And this angle is 56 degrees. How did I get that? Just by using a protractor. Because it's a graphical method. Plays a protractor there. If you've drawn it correctly, you get the angle. But we're not always going to use the graphical method. You're going to see in the next example. So here is a delivery man starts at the post office, drives 40 kilometers north, 
then 20 kilometers west, then 60 northeast. Oh, now northeast. So that's at an angle. Finally, 50 north to stop for lunch. Use the analytical method. Now you have to use the analytical method, but I'm going to give a diagram nevertheless. Here, this is how this guy has moved. There you go. So that's uh, 40 kilometers north. So that's 40 J. Remember? J is the unit vector along the y-axis, so north is along the positive y. But the next one is 20 kilometers west. West would be negative x-axis, right? That's why it's negative 20i. And then what about this? This is 42.43i plus 42.43j. How did I get that? 60 kilometers northeast. So what is that angle? It's 45 degrees. So when you break it up into the components, you're going to get the x as cosine 45 and the y as sine 45, remember? And cosine 45 and sine 45 have the same value. So that's why you get 60 times cosine 45 to get you the i and 60 times sine 45 to get you the j. That's how I got those. And because it's northeast, when you take this, it's positive along the x, it's also positive along the y. See, that's why I got both positive. And then finally, you have 50j. So now collect all the j's and the i's together. So you have totally 22.43i plus 132.43j. That's the resultant. That's question A. So you just had to do the I, see? 42.43 minus 20 gives 22.43. And then all the J's are added up. 50 plus 42, that's a 92 plus 40. That's how you get 132.43 J. So that's the A part. In the B part, how far is the restaurant from the post office? Oh, so we come, uh, draw that vector now. Let's draw that vector. And you know, to find the magnitude, what you need is, I'm not drawn it yet, I'm going to do it. To find the magnitude, you square this, square this, add them, and then take the square root. So that gives you the distance. It's 134.32 kilometers away. Oh, now I've drawn it. So that's the displacement vector. From here to here, that's the displacement vector. And that's going to have a length 134.32 uh, kilometers. And see, if he returns directly from the restaurant to the post office, what's his displacement vector on the return trip? Oh, so now he goes straight from there. This time is smart. He goes straight back. Okay, if he goes straight back, then it's going to be the same length in the opposite direction. So what do you say? Okay, so I called it vector D, and that's going to be negative 22.43i, negative 132.43j. You see, I just changed the numbers of this, and that's it's going to give you negative 134.32 kilometers as the distance, definitely. What is D? What's his compass heading? On the return trip, mm, remember tan theta is y by x. Now, y here is j, so all you got to do is negative 132.43 divided by negative 22.43, because tan theta is y divided by x, which in this case is j divided by i. So you get 80.38 degrees south of west. So I've shown the angle there, and you see that's a bigger angle. And how are you moving? You're moving from the west, to the south. So that's why it's called south of west. See? South of west. So that's how you do that. I hope you got that. Here is another example. A barge is pulled by the two tugboats shown in the following figure. One tugboat pulls on the barge with a force of 4,000 units at 15 degrees above the line AB. Diagram is given. So one is pulling that side. The other one applies how much? 5,000 units, an angle of 12 degrees below that line. 
And so both together are trying to move this barge, move, trying to move it. So we have to find the resultant. What do you do? The idea is we first break this into its X and Y components. So you get the X component, get the Y component, do the same here, find the X component and the Y component. That's what we're going to do. Okay? So F1 is 4,000 and the angle is 15 degrees. So what I did is I've shown you the X and the Y components of that one. You see? Uh, please be careful when you take the right angle triangle. You see that? This angle is what is 15. So remember, this becomes the adjacent side. Be careful. This is the adjacent side of the angle. So that will be cosine, but this will be sine. Okay? So F1x is 4,000 sine 15, and F1y is 4,000 cosine 15. And then put in the calculator, find the numbers. Got F1x and F1y. Do the same with F2. I'm going to show you. All right. So those are the components now. Again, this is going to be cosine. This is going to be sine. It depends on where you take the angle. Whatever side you take the angle with respect to always becomes cosine because it's the adjacent side. So that gives you 5,000 sine 12 and then 5,000 cosine 12. Get those numbers. So now once we have X and Y for each, take the X's together. So... 1035.7 minus 1039.6 y minus look at the diagram this is positive while this is what negative so the x components are opposite to each other that's why i've taken the minus here okay that gives negative 3.9 but the Y components are both positive, so add them. Add them, add the Y components, you get that. Once you get that, to find the magnitude square both, add them, take the square root. Yes. Gives 8,754 units. Now that's basically because this, this number is really so small. It only makes a minimum effect. And what about the angle? Well, again, for the same reason, because this x is almost zero, we know that the resultant is going to be almost perfectly along the y-axis. So that's what I've done. I've not actually found it. Direction is along the line A, B. Okay, along the line A, B. Where's my B? Okay, that's A, B. Along A, B. I hope you got that. And then we come to the final question. A diver explores a shallow reef off the coast of Belize. She initially swims 90 meters north, or 90 meters north, makes a turn to the east and continues for 200 meters, then follows a big grouper for 80 meters in the direction 30 degrees north of east. So that's the east. That's why this is 30 degrees north of east. In the meantime, a local current displaces her by 150 meters south. Uh-oh. So it pushes her 150 meters south. And then assuming the current is no longer present in what direction, how far should she now swim to come back to the point where she started? So she started from here, and she's right now here. So she has to swim all the way back this much. That's what we're going to try to find. It's the same idea as before. Uh, so this, you should... Okay, so... What I've done is I've broken each one into the X and Y components, but really it's only this vector which has an X and a Y. Okay, see that? All the others are just Y. This is Y, I mean this is just X, and this is just Y. So it's only vector CD which had to be broken into its X and Y. So I did that. 
That's 30 degrees, so this would be 80 cosine 30. All right, by now you should know why, because this is the adjacent side. I'm taking the angle with respect to that. So that's why it's 80 cosine 30. And this is going to be 80 sine 30, right? Yeah, 80 sine 30. So the numbers come out. And then this is 200 meter, this is 90 meter. So what is the total X? Look at it carefully, 200 plus 69.3, yeah, 200 plus 69.3, that's the total X. That's 269.3, and what's the total Y? You have Y here um, and minus that, right? Oh, you also have the 90, I forgot, 90, and then you have this much, see that? So 90 plus 40, because that's pointing up. You know, this, it's the component of this, so that's pointing up. But then you have minus 150. Oh, I hope you're watching carefully. So 90 plus 40 minus 150, so that gives negative 20. That's Fe. So we got Fe as negative 20, see that? And then AF, we got 269.3. Find the magnitude by squaring and adding and taking the square root. So you get 270 meters and tan theta is again y by x. So 20 divided by 269.3 and the angle as I've shown is north of west. Correct? Because it's starting, mm, yeah, north of west because it's like that and it was supposed to go this way. So remember if I'd drawn an a line here, parallel line to the x-axis, I would have got the same angle here. I'm saying it's this way, north of west. I hope all this makes sense. This is such an important chapter where we just looked at what a vector means and then we looked at how to take the dot product of two vectors and again to take the cross product of two vectors. And then I gave you multiple examples of how to find the resultant using the graphical method or the analytical method. Uh, I hope all of this makes sense. I'm a little tired after spending some time making this video as usual, but it's okay if it makes sense to you. Thank you, and we'll see you all on the next video.